Good morning, everyone. We will call this Economic Development Committee to order. Thank you. Um, first up, the IDA. Miss Jody. Paul Cop. Everyone has received that report. Are there any questions for Jody this morning? No. Going once. Mr. Moore. Jody, could you... One of those things... No, you don't have to, Jody. I see you have... One of those things you're holding up is what I want to know. <laughs> Three places. Get well, so... Thank you very much. Any other question? Being none, thank you very much. Uh, the the Empire of Zone. Community Resources. Mr. Mascarini. Good morning. Uh, we do have one referral this morning. It's from the town of Wilmington. Wilmington. They're uh, trying to complete an amendment to their local land use code. Uh, the proposal does not have an adverse impact on county property, and a letter of no comment is recommended on that. Would someone care to move by Mr. Morrow? Second by Mr. Moore. Questions? Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> He's not here, so we can't support all of them. I don't blame you. For the discussion, be none. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about today because there has been some confusion. I get a lot of calls from board members on these water grants and, that you hear about. Um, and, and you've had other people come here to the board to present those. And, and I figure I should probably kind of tell you... <clears throat> What, what it really is. Um, there, there's two different processes now with EFC and their water grants versus their traditional DWSRF or CWSRF financing applications. Um, however, in order to qualify, the uh, requirements are still one and the same. So I think a lot of people are under the inf or impression that, well, I can go after uh, this grant funding and, and uh, move forward from there, which really isn't the case. There's a series of steps you have to take in order to uh, remain eligible for that. On March 1st, the financial applications were due to uh, EFC for both water and sewer. That is the traditional mechanism to fund water sewer projects. Water typically has uh, a grant component where sewer does not through that process. Um, in order to take advantage of the financing, you have to have an approved engineering report, you have to complete Seeker, you have to complete SHPO, which is Historic Preservation, and you have to have a bond resolution. Okay? Um, on April 15th of this year, which is coming around the corner, the water grants are due. They call them the water grants, but yes, they include sewers. I know Mr. Scott Savava keeps saying, well, I want sewer money, right? <laughs> so yeah, they call them water grants. And, but it's all about clean water is what it's about. Um, same mechanism applies. You have to have all those items complete in order to qualify. You'll hear EFC use the term administratively shovel ready quite often. And those are the items you have to have complete in order to even qualify uh, for those grant funds. Now, if you have those items, you can potentially take advantage of some grant money for sewer, which traditionally is hard to come by. Um, it used to be you get 20% or you get 0% financing. You're, you're really happy with your, with your package because that's the best you could do uh, through sewer. At this point, they will cover up to 20% of the project cost in grant if you're determined a hardship community. And there's MHIs, which is median household income, that play into that whole scenario, um, as, as well as user rates. They, they look at what you're currently paying versus what, what they figure your users in your district can't afford to pay, and that's how they develop a funded package specifically for you. On water, <coughs> you could... Uh, get up to 60% grant or a maximum of $2 million in funding, whichever kind of smaller. Um, so if you have a $10 million project, you're, you're not going to get $6 million in grant. Best you can do is get $2 million in grant. But on, on a 
lesser cost project that you could potentially get 60% funded uh, through, through a water project. So basically, I just wanted to, to talk about that quickly. I don't want to take up a bunch of your time. I just know there's a lot of confusion out there, and there's a lot of people hitting you guys from all different angles on, on these things, and I just wanted to kind of let you know what the reality of the process is, what the reality of the program is, and how you can best utilize that in your communities. We have put in a bunch, um, and we're looking to put in a couple more um, April 15th for communities that are administratively shovel ready um, and get, get to that point. Hopefully we'll have some success there. Thank you, Michael. That's very helpful, actually. Um, question from the Minister. <laughs> I think where a lot of the confusion comes from is the hype that the state plays in regards to all these infrastructure dollars are available. Go out there and replace the aged infrastructure. And when you look into it, you find that most of those dollars that are available are loans. Uh, and, and if you don't qualify, uh, it's a hardship, then you're not going to get anything. And unfortunately, the qualifications for a hardship, which is what I met with Mike last week, which I experienced, I mean, we've got a number of, you know, thousands of users on both water and sewer. And what you find is that you've got a mix there in regards to incomes and so on. So it, it just... It's just a lot of hype out there that all this money is out there to replace your age water infrastructure and it's not really there. And I, I'm not even sure what the threshold cap is right now from the controller for sewer, 700 and something dollars is it? Uh, it just came out, so I think it's over 800, um, 800 now. per year. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, and it's, it's a crisis, you know, in, in, in most communities. Um, not only in New York State, but nationwide. And, uh, you know, it has to be addressed. And how do you do it and keep it affordable? Thank you, Scott. Mr. Chair, yeah, when uh, Sean and I were in Washington, we, we lobbied really hard and uh, pressed the issue for the, the small towns for uh, sewer infrastructure. And, you know, they all told us about the same thing. Well, USDA has a ton of money. Go after it. Well, uh, USDA uses the Census Bureau's... Uh, America Community statistics. Survey. Yeah. You know, and it's uh, and we, we tried to instill these guys that those numbers are not correct. I think for the town of Elizabethtown sewer project, I think the user rate is like 1500 bucks. And all of my credit. I believe it was. You know, that's not an affordable number for the users in Elizabethtown. So, again, we, we worked hard on that one. Uh, did we get any messages across? I, I think enough for them to take a look at us again. But, uh, you know, it just, it is not, they're not playing with the same numbers that they need to be playing with to uh, make it affordable for our users. So, we did bring it forward and, uh, you know, we'll see. Thank yep. you. And we do appreciate your advocacy down there. Yeah, for those board members that, that are unclear, we've been dealing with this for a couple of years. Some of the new board members, I think, could probably use a better explanation. The, the census data that, that used to be utilized to obtain funding on many of these large capital projects is no longer utilized to determine who qualifies. It's a big problem. The American Community Survey has taken the place of that. What we're seeing in Essex County are median household incomes that are heavily inflated. Um, in certain areas, areas that always qualified do not anymore. Uh, I'll give you, a, for instance, a village of Port Henry, the uh, number and median household income is around $54,000 a year, according to the American Community Survey. That's higher than Lake Placid. Very unlikely. Um, and, and it went up, it almost doubled in a five year period. So I'm not sure where all, where all that information's arrived at and, and how it's compiled. What I do know is a lot of our people aren't even getting surveys. It's based on similar demographics and similar areas and, and then a number's plugged into your community. Town of North Hudson, I'm pretty confident that they're between zero and 100,000 median household income. That's the margin of error for the town of North Hudson. So you could, I, I'm pretty confident that that's correct. It probably is between zero and 100,000, Mr. Moore. Um, but when you're looking at that wide of a spectrum, it, it's really pushing you out of a lot of opportunity for, for funding that, that, you, that you really do qualify for. It was met for communities like Essex County. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Mr. Harrington? I, I think it's also important that these projects, probably more than likely, are going to involve a, a, about a three-year timeline. 
that there's the, all of the applications that one must uh, comply with, and we need to understand that we're not going to get anywhere without the services of community resources who really, really uh, make it successful for the towns. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, enough of that soapbox. You can tell you brought up something that really gets to me. That's one thing that really bothers me. Um, the CFA, Consolidated Funding Applications, they have not been announced yet. Uh, if, if they follow the traditional timeline, it, it's going to fall somewhere next month, month after, with a summer submission for your projects and applications. Um, if you have projects, uh, let me know sooner rather than later. Typically, we do about 15. And then if you've seen one, they can be pretty, uh, you know, significant in size. Uh, traditional CDBG applications, about 200 pages. So in order to be able to meet all your needs and try to put our best foot forward, uh, the sooner we know that, the better. Basically, what you're looking at are parks and recreation, community development block grant, historic preservation, waterfront development, government efficiency, engineering planning grants, uh, green initiative grant program, which is a stormwater related, and uh, water quality improvement program through the DEC. Though there are some other programs that are included in there, but those are basically what, what uh, our communities are, are usually trying to get projects approved in. So if you have projects, I know I've talked to some of you, uh, the list is getting larger, but sooner rather than later would be fantastic. Thank you. Uh, the only last thing I have is a quick thing on the Youth Bureau. Um, on March 7th, we did have a meeting here. Most of your communities attended. I want to thank you. The attendance at those meetings has really improved, um, and, and it's helped out. Uh, the Department of Health sent their entire staff from Saranac Lake down to that meeting, and they worked with your communities individually on uh, developing their safety plans for the summer recreation programs. Uh, I, last year that happened, and I think it was really beneficial for both the Department of Health and for your communities. A lot of the confusion went away on what's required, what they need, and, uh, and, and your, the folks in your town, I think, really appreciated uh, that service. So thank you for, for getting them involved. Um, just so you know, you have to have, if you're going to open 60 days prior, you have to let them know. So you'll be looking sometime in May that you'll have to uh, let the uh, Department of Health know for permitting purposes and being able to get your, your camps open. Uh, lifeguard training did begin. We're, we're doing that now. I've heard from a lot of you guys that, that you're struggling to get lifeguards. Uh, that seems to be constant throughout the county. Once we receive uh, the people that uh, passed, we will send that out to each and every town for as a recruiting tool that you can hopefully utilize and, and get your, your, uh, your beaches and day camps approved. Um, responding to emergency, I did attach the flyer. Uh, just so you know, <coughs> every town is required to have at least two um, responding to emergencies on site at day camp programs. Uh, it's recommended that larger camps especially have three for uh, basically you have if your camp goes in different directions you have to have an RTE at each one of those venues that they are at. So if you have kids at a beach and then have a group of kids at the play area, you're supposed to have an RT at both locations. The third one is in case of absence. If somebody isn't there that day, you have that third person that can fill in. Our RTE will teach the CPR for the professional rescuer. So just so everybody's aware of that, that's the stumbling block um, that has happened when people are going out and getting trainings on their own. They're not receiving that qualification, and, and that's where we've been getting hung up with the Department of Health the last couple of years. That is a requirement um, by them to have the CPR for the professional rescuer. Rescuer, and only our class teaches that. If you go get RTE somewhere else, they're not, there's not even a CPR component. We add it on. Oh, how long is that certification good for? Well, that's funny. Um, <clears throat> the RT is good for two years. CPR for the professional rescuers good for two years. Problem you're going to run into is Department of Health doesn't recognize the um, certification on the card. 
Um, we passed a resolution last year. Mr. Politi, I think, uh, was pushing that, that he would like the state to follow the recommendation of the American Red Cross, who are the professionals in the field, and uh, make the certifications good for as long as, as uh, American Red Cross says they're good. But Department of Health makes you do an annual update, an annual renewal, even though your card may say you're certified according to them, you are not. I see, I see that course is four <laughs> evenings, and it has a starting time but a no ending time. Yeah. I mean, if that's like a two hour per evening, is there any week we, we could have that course taught on a Saturday? Uh, the commute to Mariah from Minerva is going to take over an hour, <laughs> and I, you know, I'm going to have to send two people to that training? Yep. If, if I could set up another training in the South uh, to accommodate them, I've actually been trying to. My, the struggle that I've run into is finding instructors. So if you know of an instructor that I could get a hold of, I have talked to Lynette in the town of Newcomb. Uh, she's not certified to teach RTE, but she is certified to do WSI and some of those other courses. And maybe we can take advantage of that and spread out the training around the county. Or just the uh, idea of evenings in a row is very difficult for anybody to attend. It is. You know, if we could do a one-day training, yep. then it would be a little bit easier for our people. Plus, who wants to go to Mariah? <laughs> um, Michael, Mr. Chairman, I think I'm not sure. Mike Sullivan is aware of the need to have this RTE certified. Yep, she's, she's excellent. Um, there's other courses that the uh, Department of Health will allow you to take. They're not plentiful around here, like Wilderness First Aid CPR, and she does get all those certifications. Lynette's on the ball, so you're you're in really good shape. She's all over it. Yeah. Anything further for Michael? That's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up we have Ms. McCaffrey, our historian. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so uh, in my report this month, uh, you basically have uh, an overview of what we're going to be doing at the museum for the upcoming season. Um, I have noted our exhibits, events, and the summer lecture series. Um, we might be adding a couple more things here and there, but for the most part, it's complete. Um, we will be kicking off the season with our usual uh, annual antique and classic car show, and that uh, accompanies the grand opening of our exhibits. And that will be June 11th, and the museum admission is free that day. Um, the 2016 exhibits will include uh, two art shows in the new Rosenberg Gallery and then two other exhibits. And uh, I will go into more detail about those um, next month. Um, we have a full lecture series and those were changing the night. Those will be uh, Thursday nights at 7 p.m. throughout July and August. And you can see we have a, a variety of subjects scheduled. And there will be a free wine and cheese reception at the museum before each uh, lecture. We have also added a couple of new events. We're doing something that we are calling uh, Sunday Jaunts, which will be outings to various activities uh, throughout Essex County. Um, we're going to do a few of those. We only have one scheduled so far, and that's our first one, uh, April 3rd. And we'll be visiting a Lake Placid Sap Shack um, to learn about maple sugaring. Um, so as we add those, I'll, I'll keep you updated. Uh, the other event we're adding this uh, season is a historic house tour of Westport, and we're going to do that in the fall uh, on October 8th. Um, we will also be offering our Adirondack Fire Tower program uh, to area schools and families, uh, and those dates are to be announced uh, as we get closer. Um, so that's uh, the schedule so far, and as we add things, I will be adding them in my report, and I'll go into detail about more of the events and the exhibits uh, in the future. And Thank you very much. Do we have any questions or comments? For Aurora, I thank you very much. Um, Ms. 
Dimming is not here, you all have a report from uh, Cooperative Extension. So we will move to Mr. James McKenna. Good morning. Uh, I guess, yeah, right, good afternoon. Uh, no, not too much to report other than I think that we can certainly see the effects of uh, the lack of snow that we've certainly had uh, really from December on. I'm not sure if uh, we had a major snowstorm this year. And, you know, we can, we can see that now starting to be reflected in some of the numbers that we track. Um, we subscribe to what's called Smith Travel Research. What that is, is a, uh, a firm that the lodging industry reports to. 68% of our lodging facilities in the county report to that. That shows December occupancy was off 9.8%. Revenues were off 9.5%. When we look at January, um, I'm sorry, uh, occupancy was off 9.8, revenue 9.3. January occupancy was down 9.5% and revenue was down 15.5%. So that means not only did occupancy decline, but room rates declined at the same time, people trying to compensate for it. So when you look at um, lodging sales, and, and I, don't, I think that when we look at across the board of all of our lodging facilities, I think some of the smaller ones even had larger declines than that. Lodging, we know, is a third of really what the visitor spends. So we can magnify that by, you know, the restaurant industry and the retail industry. And then we can also look that if it's down, uh, if, the, if the tourism sales through lodging are down about 10%, you know, you multiply that for sales tax. So I think there's a ripple there is my, my, my point. Um, and another thing that we see happen too is that the Canadian exchange has certainly started affecting things this winter. Especially right now, not only is there a lack of snow, but the Canadian vacation weeks happen during March. So that that Canadian exchange is also compounding the situation. And we anticipate that that's going to continue throughout at least the next four or five months, probably well into the year. So we think that, uh, and I'm just going to comment on that briefly, that has a double effect. When the Canadian dollar is down like that so much, 30%, not only do the Canadians not come to our area, but U.S. visitors from our metropolitan areas that feed us then end up going to Canada because it's, you know, it's sort of a, it's a good deal. So, you know, I think that this year is going to be a challenge overall. One good thing, um, well, before that, I'm going to just comment a little more on winter. Um, and we know Whiteface, uh, Whiteface was down about 18%, but then we get to Gore, Gore's down to about 30%, we hear. And I think that shows a little bit that destination stuff works a little bit. But, you know, that affects a lot of different things when the major employers for the winter season are down. They cut right back. So I think, you know, we've got a little bit of a ripple going on. So there's the pessimism stuff. The optimistic stuff is that, you know, it looks like heading into April, we have one of the strongest meeting and convention seasons we've ever had in our county coming in. And that's going to, you know, and then that takes us into June, where it looks like most of the major events countywide are still going to be up. So we're, hopefully we're going to rebound. But I think it's, it's a challenge. Not only, you know, I, I think that we have to understand that the winners recently have been extreme either way, it seems. So um, I think we have to have the ability to, to have programs and plans in place so that we're willing to, we can adapt to sort of changing weather conditions. Um, and one thing we did see happen this year is that everybody familiar with fat tire bikes? You know what those are? Going snow, mud, whatever. But, you know, that was something that people that came to do cross-country skiing, we saw them starting to rent fat tire bikes. So I just think that we have to start thinking about things. We can't just throw in the towel and say there's no snow, or there's no ice on the lake for ice fishing, or there's certainly snowmobile has been hit probably as hard as any industry this year, but I guess we have to be in a position to uh, really, okay, that's what we've got, so what are we going to do? Because, well, I mean, it really, when a county like ours that has a large percentage based on the travel industry, I think we've got to be prepared a little bit more. Um, I think that's it. There's any questions. Thank you, James. Questions? Um, Mr. Harrington first. Uh, yes. Uh, for the past two years, 
um, we've expressed a concern about the early closing of the state campsites. Uh, I think the state should realize that the Champlain Valley has an extended foliage season as compared to the inner Adirondacks and that we need to take advantage of that. We need to address these concerns now and not wait to the 1st of September when the gates are closed. Now, I have heard rumors that this is being considered, and I would hope, or I know that you would advocate for this in a, a strong manner. Uh, we, we really need to take advantage of this. We'll, we'll do that, Supervisor, and uh, certainly we discussed it last fall when you pointed that out, and again, I think that uh, working through DEC, we'll certainly get behind that. Well, we really need to address that. That's one area where the eastern part of the county uh, can help to pull its weight and bring For sure. added, uh, tax monies and, and what have you. For sure. I find it kind of uh, uh, odd that during September and October of last year, there was an extended amount of advertising uh, in regards to uh, the state and advocating the Adirondacks. And yet, you, when the campers come up here, they're closed. So, something's got to get synchronized here. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Mr. Gillen. Jim, I just want to thank you. Uh, uh, Jim came to, uh, we held a landmark uh, salmon restoration symposium this last Friday with a whole lot of speakers and stuff, and Jim came, spent the whole day, learned more about salmon than he I ever did. wanted to, <laughs> but was a contributor. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Further questions or comments? Mr. Munn. Uh, the, uh, the closure, or the potential closure of the railroad uh, tracks um, in Saranac Lake, you foresee that having a direct effect as well as the uh, Canadian dollar, because I know a lot of the tourists were coming up for that rail bike. Yeah, um, we don't really have real good numbers on what that is, but certainly uh, the uncertainty of what's going to happen there we're, we're concerned about for sure. Uh, we've sort of been not taking a position on that because we have to work with it, whatever happens, so we're sort of preparing our thought process at least to if the rails stay, what happens, and if the trail is gone, or if the trail is there, uh, how do we market that best? I think I have heard from the rail bikes, I'm not sure, I think they're looking at alternate sites too, I'm not sure about that, but you know, certainly uh, I think that they came on about mid-summer, and I think the number is nine or 10,000, is that what they hit? I think so. Yeah, something like that. Um, I think it has to affect more in the Lake Clear area, I think, than anywhere. Further questions or comments for Mr. McKenna? Being none, thank you very much. You, sir. Any further business to come before the committee? Going once, we stand adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>